this is Valentine's Day uh, that I'm giving this talk, and I, I had to cancel earlier, and I didn't plan on talking about sex on Valentine's Day, but in the audience there's lots of red, and it's probably going to make it even more fun. So I get a lot of laughs when I talk about aging, so you'll probably hear the, I should say, when I talk about sexuality, uh, aging may not be so funny as I'm getting older myself, but most importantly, recognize that this is a topic that all of us are a little bit uncomfortable with, and I think it's very important to recognize that you need to make sure that you can communicate with your partners as well as your providers. And we'll go over that theme many times as we go on. So recognize that we want intimacy all our lives, from being a little baby, nursed by our mothers, all the way to the end of life. And intimacy and the desire for intim intimacy never goes away. Now, it's not the same as when our hormones are raging and we're all hot and heavy at each other. But it can even be better as we get older because of the maturity of our desire. And I think what we have to recognize is that all those hormones, all those chemicals in our brain when we're partnering up with somebody that make desire so intense change as we get older, particularly with length of the relationship. In other words, as we have the attraction chemicals, they make it easy to be with our partner. As those attraction chemicals fade, then we have the more bonding chemicals. And sometimes those bonding chemicals are strong and sometimes they're relatively weak. And that accounts for the waxing and waning of our desire for our partner in a mature relationship and with a longer relationship. Not to mention that, but studies have shown that the same sexual stimulus, meaning the rubbing up that you used to do that used to work all the time, as we get older, sometimes doesn't work, and we have to change that. And you can actually do brain chemistry studies to show that when we're in that hot and passionate stage of a relationship, the effect on the brain is distinctly different from the very same touch than after we've been together 20 years. And they've actually done these studies to show that. So how we react to each other is very important. So maybe we should amp up our own response to our partner as we see that and recognize that maybe if they're making the same effort, that really is up to us to get the same response because to expect our partner to make more and more effort as we get older can be more difficult. As we change, we expect them to change, and it's always on our partner to be the one to make the extra step, to cross past the middle. And I think it's very important to recognize that that sometimes leads people to never meeting in the middle, and that's what the goal of today's talk is. The first part I'm going to talk about is men. I don't know why I should. You know, my mom is probably turning over in her grave because I'm not doing ladies first because you always do ladies first. But for some reason, the slides came that way. So low testosterone is probably the most important thing to talk about for men. Um, and one of the things that's out there a lot, you see low T advertised on, on the Super Bowl. Uh, you see lots of ads in the sports pages that are encouraging us men to go to our provider and to get a testosterone checked. And that's very important because at the root of many of the issues with aging and sexuality could be a low testosterone. It is a very underdiagnosed problem. Even now that we're getting some pharmaceutical advertising and we're getting some provider advertising and it's getting newspaper press and even I'm beginning to see television ads, we're still only diagnosing about 15% of men with bona fide low testosterone. The simple thing to do is go get a blood test. It's a simple blood test. You can get it with your cholesterol, with your PSA, any screening lab. Simple blood test to screen for low testosterone. And it's important to recognize that testosterone is not just <clears throat> helping with sexual function, with erections. It helps desire. And as you'll see in a moment, desire in men as we get older becomes more like desire in women. Granted, when we're young, desire is autopilot. As we get older, we need more. We are more encumbered by stress and fatigue and things like that, and that's when testosterone comes into it, and that's when the low testosterone certainly can come into it. So as the testosterone declines as we age, when does it cross a point that it can be important in our sexual function? Well, the only thing you can do is get that measured. Now, what we recognize is that men don't have a menopause because we don't have menstrual periods, and there's something called andropause, that's what it is being called in the literature now, but that's not really what it is because we don't have an abrupt decline in testosterone like women do after their last menstrual period or after a hysterectomy with removal of the ovaries. So what do we call it? Well, 
there's a fancy word that uh, somebody in Greece came up with called androcles, which means slow decline of masculinity, which I think is the way we should look at that. Testosterone declines about 3% per year after about age 35. So when do you get to a low? Well, that depends on what you were starting with. So a man who started with a relatively low testosterone um, will certainly have a low level much earlier than his colleagues who started with a higher level. Having said that, every man needs a different level, and since we don't know where you start, we have to rely on overall lab values to decide who needs to be treated. So subtle things like lack of energy, lack of ability to exercise, inability to lose weight with the same amount of exercise, eating less and gaining more. These are the things that happen for men with a low testosterone. Um, changes in sexual function, of course, with loss of erections, but more importantly, loss of sexual desire. So this is when I see a man for low testosterone. Usually his wife is bringing him in and he said, this guy was on autopilot for 20 years and now he couldn't be bothered. I can walk around naked, do anything I want, and the guy will not move. I can't budge him. Well, he probably has a low testosterone. So don't think that he doesn't love you anymore, he's no longer attracted, he's having an affair. Think he might have something physically wrong. Think that first. And so other things that are more subtle, such as mood changes, depression, get all this? This is sort of the things that guys experience as they age. So how do we differentiate the guy who's just getting older and working too hard and the kids are stressing him out and the finances are stressing him out? Well, we don't. And that's why I say go for a lab value. And it's very easy to give hormone replacement therapy for men. There are shots and there are gels and there are long-acting pellets that can be given and it's very easy and very safe. So erectile dysfunction. Recognize that Again, as men age, and studies have shown that there is a decline in erectile rigidity for almost all men after about the age of 35 or 40, even those that don't complain and even those whose partners don't complain. Well, recognize that other medical illnesses such as diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, high cholesterol, and the other things that I talked about, emotional or uh, psychological distress, uh, smoking, excess drinking, alcohol, these are things can affect your sexual function even uh, if overall your other physical functions are good. So many times declining erections, inability to maintain an erection, a lot of times the partner is kind of sheepishly saying, no, it's not as firm as it used to be because ladies are so nice to us. They're not going to hurt our feelings. And so they're the ones who can tell me. And just the other day, the guy shook his head, no, I'm not having a problem. And she's going in the background, you know, very quietly letting me know that, yes, there is a problem. So obviously the blue pill is out there. Viagra been out there for the longest period of time. There are two others called Cialis and Levitra. Um, they're all very effective, all very safe within certain limitations. Um, ask your doctor about that. There's a new one called Avanafil. We don't have the trade name for it yet, uh, what the brand name's gonna be. And this one's gonna be uh, a much faster onset. It could take effect as short as eight to 10 minutes. Um, so for the clinical trial, um, the ladies were given a stopwatch. And so they were uh, told to hit the stopwatch when their gentleman took the pill and hit the stopwatch again when all was good to go. Um, so we'll see if they're able to make that claim. There's something called a VED, or vacuum erectile device. Uh, that's an external apparatus that enhances. Um, there are injections that uh, give erections. There's something called Muse, which is a little pellet that you put inside. And then there's an implant. Now, a lot of people are aghast when I say implant because we think that that's just total failure and the worst thing in the world. But it is a surgery, it is a major surgery, and you do have to recover from the surgery. But if you look at the satisfaction rates for all the treatments for erectile dysfunction, a penile implant actually has the very highest, well over 95% satisfaction rates compared to the pills, which have about a 70% uh, satisfaction rate. Now, saying something about natural male enhancers. Uh, I saw this on the sports page this morning. It was a quarter page ad about this sexual response. Be very careful. Those have been shown to have contaminants. Um, they've been having relatively innocuous contaminants like male hormone uh, and Viagra, Levitra, or Cialis. But they've also been shown to have some very serious contaminants um, that stimulate the brain. Uh, many of these are much like amphetamine type medications which basically make the mood better and so they enhance the sexual response. Uh, a study that was an anonymous study uh, commissioned by the 
FDA looked at these products and found that over 40% of them had contaminants and did not have the ingredients listed on the side. They're also very expensive, about $3 a day. So be very careful and tell your doctor if you're taking any of these for sure.